rebuilding a tangy model steam engine part 13. Etch primer and filler, plus making a new crank web. Well the time has come to take the engine apart to finally finish it. It's that time when I need to use some etch primer and some filler, and then after rubbing down the filler, I'll give it another coat of primer before I give it the top coats. I haven't decided what colour this is going to be yet. Off comes the steam chest, revealing the port face. The condition of the port face is not as bad as it looks on the video. In this clip I'm removing the crank pin from the crank web, and here I'm temporarily removing the bolt that holds the connecting rod into the crosshead. This will be replaced with a proper bearing pin. It's not a good idea to ever use just ordinary bolts as a bearing surface. The piston's not very tight on the piston rod, so I can remove it quite easily with my right angle scriber. And here I'm sliding out the crosshead, and the final part to be removed is the old crankshaft and the crank web, and I'm going to replace both the crankshaft and the crank web in the fullness of time. Using a socket on the end of a screwdriver attachment, here I'm removing the gland nut. And all that's left is the main casting. And parts of this are looking a bit oily now, so I'll be cleaning it up later. This is the cast iron base, and I've removed the paint from the top surface because I think it will look better and provide a more accurate platform for the engine. And before giving it a coat of etch primer, the first thing to do is to clean it off with some panel wipe. I'm using this on a paintbrush, and you can see clearly all the oil running onto the bench. Not forgetting the outer crankshaft support pedestal, which is also quite oily. In between these clips, I cleaned the brush, applied some more panel wipe until I got rid of every trace of the oil. And now it's painting time. I'm in the outer part of the workshop next to a wide open door, and it's a coat of etch primer. I'm using the Auto Paint Northern Etch Primer. Dave at the Steam Workshop recommended it, and it really is good stuff. It covers well, sprays well, and sticks well, which is all I need. It's important to paint all of the parts, so I'm painting this bearing standard as well. To give the etch primer some drying time, I think I'll make the crank web. This is the old crank web, and it's a bit of a mess. In my old metal cutting bandsaw is a piece of brass bar, and I'm chopping this to a reasonable length. And by the time this piece of metal was cut, the etch primer had dried. It's very quick drying stuff, this. And this sequence shows how many parts of the casting needed a bit of attention. This is cellulose stopper, and it's great for this job. You can't put it on too thick, but for this job I don't need to. Once the bandsaw had done its stuff, finally I ended up with a very uneven piece of brass bar. So I set my digital caliper to the diameter of the original crank web, and off we go. It's lathe time. One or two viewers have commented and said, why do you always run your lathe sequences in high speed? Well, because it's really boring. So for the couple of viewers who commented, just for you, for a special treat, this video is running in real time. I do occasionally run lathe sequences in real time, but I soon speed them up because it's much easier to watch. Oh, sorry, I just dropped off. I was editing the video and it was so boring I fell asleep. What day is it? What time is it? Oh yes, I remember. I'm turning this piece of brass just to clean it up in real time. That's enough of that. I've finished it, turned it round in the chuck, and now I'm at a sensible speed. This is four times normal speed. I much prefer the lathe sequences running at a higher speed. Once I'd cleaned up the other face, it's not 100%, but I pushed it into position using the tailstock chuck. And I use this a lot, it's a great way of making things sit squarely in the chuck. It's a much more accurate way of fitting parts into the chuck than by hand. You may have noticed that the tone of the lathe has just changed. That's because I've just enlisted the help of the longitudinal traverser. So now to move the lathe tool, I don't have to move the handle. Because these videos are tutorials for beginners, generally these days I work most of the time on the Boxford lathe. So much so, I think I'm going to sell my Smart & Brown Model 1024. The only trouble with the Boxford is it's much smaller and I get used to taking very large cuts from working on the Smart & Brown lathe which is much bigger and more robust. You can hear the tool dancing about because it's not as rigid as the Smart & Brown. If anyone's watching this and wants to buy a Smart & Brown Model 1024 lathe, please email me via the website. Please be aware I cannot post it this Smart & Brown lathe is a tool room lathe, so it has a very wide bed, 
and it has a 6 inch centre height so it will swing a piece of metal up to 12 inches in diameter. I've turned the part round in the chuck and I'm holding it by the part that I've machined and as before I've pushed the part into the main chuck using the tailstock chuck to make sure it's fully square against the chuck jaws. It is essential that this part ends up being accurate. The next part of the job is to turn the outside diameter and this diameter needs to be slightly larger than the one on the crank web because all of the finishing will be done when this crank web is fitted to the crankshaft. Note that I'm not machining the outside diameter all the way to the chuck because I don't want to run into the jaws. The next part of the process is first of all as usual a centre drill followed by a twist drill which is one imperial size under the size I need the hole to be. So then I slow down the lathe and this is in real time using back gear. A reamer goes through and sizes the hole to a quarter of an inch in diameter and it gives a really good finish and it's accurate. Everything is running in real time at this point. And as well as the spindle speed being low, I'm also feeding in the reamer quite slowly. If I speed up this part of the job, then the reamer will probably cut over size and the hole will be slightly too big, which to be fair doesn't really matter because I will be cutting the crankshaft to suit the hole. But as I've mentioned many times, this is a tutorial designed for beginners who probably don't know this and that's why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. Many years ago nobody told me this and I used to ream holes far too quickly and there were always a rattle fit and I could never figure out why until some wise model engineer told me how to do it properly and thinking about it it was probably my friend Don English who taught me an awful lot in the early days. I have a slight problem, my parting tool is not adjusted to be long enough and even if it was it's a thin one so it would wobble about. I've parted off as far as I can and I'm finishing off with a hacksaw but now it's top tip time. Using a hacksaw in the lathe can be fraught with difficulty. The first thing you should always do is put a piece of wood underneath the area that's been sawn. You could actually hacksaw under power but I don't recommend this and now watch why I use the piece of wood. Unless you're extremely careful the hacksaw breaks through and clobbers the piece of wood. And that's why if you look at my lathe bed, you will notice that there are no hacksaw marks in it. What have I achieved? Well, I've got a very rough looking piece of metal here. It's good on one side, the hole is dimensionally accurate to this side, but this other side is rough. When I make the crankshaft in the next episode, all will be revealed. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.